very much for coming. My name is Hannah Kay, and I'm the executive producer at Intelligence Squared. For those of you who aren't familiar with Intelligence Squared, we're the world's leading forum for live debates, talks, and discussions. Big thank you to all our really fabulous speakers for coming. And our chair tonight is Deborah Bull. So please give her a very warm welcome. Thank you, thank you everyone and welcome indeed to uh, this uh, debate which we're going to be looking at body alterations. I was a dancer for many years so the notion of trying to alter my body is not alien to me but I largely did it through years in the studio and indeed the idea of trying to create art out of my body is not alien. So those are some of the things we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, people like to say dance was the first art form because to do any of the other art forms you have to move. I think that's a slight overclaim, but I've read uh, recently in preparing for this that in fact the skin was the first canvas for art, and that seems to make sense to me that primitive people would uh, put ash and dirt into their wounds in order to create what were in fact the very first tattoos. Um, we have come a long way since then, and according to The Guardian, 75-year-old David Dimbleby's tattoo is the sign of things to come because, of course, tomorrow's old people are today's young people and more and more young people are getting tattoos. Uh, it's apparently the sixth fastest growing retail business in the, U in the U.S. and the single fastest growing group uh, seeking tattoo services is middle-class suburban women. <laughs> Which is, of course, a far cry from the 1940s when, um, when a tattoo was a sort of an anti-establishment uh, uh, statement. Now you see them everywhere, um, popping out from under people's clothes and under the, um, out, out of their jeans. So I'm probably making a bigger statement by not having a tattoo than I, am, than I would be if I had a tattoo. Um, but we'll hear more about that. We're not only going to be talking about the art you put on your skin, we're going to be talking about making art out of your body and indeed about altering your body to change the image of yourself. So quite a diverse panel. And finally, we're going to be thinking about why people do this, what drives people to want to alter their bodies, what are they looking for when they seek to alter their genetic inheritance. So quite a diverse group of, um, of views here, but an expert panel. We're delighted that we have you all with us today. Um, and we're going to start. Our first guest this evening is Mo Coppoletta, um, one of London's most popular tattoo artists and owner of the family business tattoo parlor in Exmouth Market, one of London's hippest places now. Your clients apparently include the singer Paloma Faith, and you've worked with Damien Hurst for Garage Magazine, and you've worked with Liberty on fabric design. So please, a warm welcome for our first panelist, Mo Coppoletta. So Mo, my question for you is very simple. What drives people to get a tattoo, or indeed several tattoos? Well, I think that um, pigeonholing or trying <laughs> to create uh, categories of people or categories of reasons uh, for which people get tattooed is very, it's very difficult because everybody has a different story, a different uh, motivation to decide to uh, mark their bodies in a such a permanent way. Um, a lot is trend and fashion. Uh, it's very popular these, these days. Um, good part, they research a reason in order to empower themselves or to uh, re-establish their, their beliefs or to remember someone who has passed. But the majority of, uh, of our customers I think they just, uh, they just want to do it because they think they like it and they want to decorate their bodies, but without a deep or profound reason to search within their, you know, their inner self. So that, that's why I got to do it in the first place. Uh, first of all, I thought it was very cool. Then you get to know more about it and maybe research a little bit more. It's like everything, everything else. It's like collecting any sorts of, well, it's a little bit more intrusive. But I think that the majority of customers still, they do it because they like it. They don't have to have a reason to do it. They just go ahead because they think that their bodies look better or they feel better with their bodies, uh, with the decoration on their body. How long have you been doing it? Almost 20 years. 
And have you noticed a difference? Because I'm conscious that there's a sort of, I mean, some of these pictures we're seeing behind you, they are works of art. Um, and historically, I thought of tattoos as being a bit more of a, of a political statement. Perhaps I'm wrong. Uh, at the end of the day, you have a blank canvas in front of you. And what you want to do with it, it's up to you if you want to push it, if you want to exploit it at the best, I mean, according to the relationship you establish with your customer. And, uh, or you can just dish out the first thing that comes to your mind. So it depends what you want to do with it. But as I said, there are different levels. The statement is, I think it lost a little bit of that magic, if you want. It's, these days, more like a commodity. And again, it depends on what level you want to do. And, and I'm intrigued about the, the cost. And obviously, we've seen amazing, huge designs yeah. there. If I wanted a you know, mum or whatever, what would I be paying these days? It depends. It depends where you go. It depends uh, With, on to the you. studio. Uh, to us, uh, <laughs> we have minimum charges, which I think is around 100 pounds for mm. a very small tattoo. And then uh, on big, elaborate uh, tattoos, you um, we apply an hourly rate. Right. So a big tattoo like well, I don't know what went through, but big tattoos like that they don't just appear in a couple of hours. It's it's uh, several months. Job, so you have to see your customer over and over over the weeks, and so we apply now. Right? And over and over the weeks, I bet you become quite a, th a therapist, oh, yeah. a counselor. Oh, definitely. <laughs> People on the pain just dish out everything. <laughs> they say the, the darkest secrets they they hold, they don't hold anything anymore. So it becomes it becomes a relationship, especially if you you know if you see someone for so many hours, you get to know the, the person. Great. Well, I think we'll come back to that uh, notion of relationship. But for now, thank you, Mo. And we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Cindy Jackson, a cosmetic surgery pioneer who invented the extreme makeover in 1987. Uh, you were trained as an artist, in fact, and you've used your knowledge of, of, of the arts to reinvent yourself with, I think, 15 full-scale operations and dozens of non-surgical interventions. I, I am allowed to say, because it's in the script, that you're now 58, um, and you're in demand as a leading cosmetic surgery and anti-aging advisor. So please, a warm welcome for Cindy Jackson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so I'll be 59 next month, and next year I'll be 60. But, you know, you don't have to look your age these days. There's a lot we can do with modern technology. So you, uh, you started on this journey way back in 1987, and really before that extreme makeover was part of modern vocabulary, you didn't have any role models to follow. You were inventing it and yourself as you went along. So why and how did you decide, and, and where did you start? Well, I grew up in the American Midwest, and I was a wallflower and a farmer's daughter. So when you're not center stage, you're a keen observer, you know, because you're not... In the spotlight, you're looking at those who are. And I began to notice at a very early age that girls and guys who had a certain look had more power, they had better opportunities, and they were treated better. And it was just an observation. I never thought I would do anything about it. And I think a lot of people make the same observation. And then we don't really, you know, we file it away under life experience. And then I started taking art courses in, in school, in, in high school, and went on to uh, an exchange program in London and studied art here. What I learned about was da Vinci's golden ratio and proportion and things that Michelangelo and people like that back in the Renaissance began to understand how to create beauty. For example, if you're going to make a painting or a statue or uh, create a face, an image of a human being, there are certain rules you follow to make it universally attractive. They're not just random judgments, how far the eyes are apart, where the nose goes. You know, these are things that we, we in our primal brain, have got a template that we hold up against every face we encounter. And we, we, make, we make assumptions about that person based on what they're presenting to us. So, with my art studies, I. I then looked in the mirror and realized that my face was really not, it wasn't in proportion and it wasn't ever going to be considered classically attractive. Again, filed that under um, life experience. And then when I began to um, live in London, I came over in 1977, 
it became extremely apparent to me that I really didn't fit in. And um, all my friends were pretty. I love beauty. And I liked my pretty girlfriends. And I tried to learn from them, hoping some of that beauty would rub off. I hung out with them. But it wasn't until I was 33 years old when I got the opportunity to start having surgery when my father left me a small inheritance. And I had never, ever thought of having cosmetic surgery until this money unexpectedly landed in my bank account. And I didn't think twice. I thought, well, I know exactly what's wrong with my face and body. I'll change it all, as you do. And that's why I did it, because I could. And I knew what needed to be changed. And I had the, the money to do it, which quickly ran out, I might add, because I didn't really know what I was doing. And I, I, nowadays, I could do exactly what I did then for a fraction of the money and certainly many, many fewer operations. But that's why I advise other people now, because I have that expertise. But luckily, at the time, nothing went wrong. And I, I started adding a 5% improvement here, 10% there, 15% there, until it added up to 100%. And that was all fine until um, I started getting older. Then I had to learn about anti-aging. So that's my journey. It's been very interesting, very incredible, and, and, and great fun, and, and learning experience. And I, I know exactly what I'm doing. And when people say, well, surely you're done. You don't need anything else. Well, that's true. But there's always room for a little bit more improvement. I just had another rhinoplasty uh, last month because I went at Angelina Jolie's nose. The one that I had was a little bit 80s style and too, too scooped. And because I know how to achieve that, and I know the best surgeons, why not? I, so I went ahead and got it done. So, so actually, you, it, that, you, you talked about um, da Vinci and the golden ratio, which is, is a sort of constant interpretation of beauty. But then at the end, you said, no, I wanted a more modern nose. I got an 80s nose. So, um, so, so I guess. Are you, do you feel this journey will never stop? Well, I got the 80s nose in the 80s, I might add. <laughs> so, um, at that time it looked pretty good and it was in style, but the straighter Angelina Jolie slash Kate Middleton nose is very much uh, in demand now. It's the most asked for nose in any cosmetic surgeon's office. It's because it's more classic. This will last me the rest of my life. That's my last nose job. Um, but at that time, nose jobs were scoopy, you know? Uh, things have moved on a lot. Will I ever stop? Uh, I don't need to stop because I, I know all the best surgeons. I know what I'm doing, and I know exactly how everything works. So I would be the last person who should ever stop. <laughs> and you had 33 years before the first operation. Did you, did you try other ways to, in, to change your relationship with your face that were not surgical in that time? No, I never really thought about it. I, no. I was a rock singer. I had plenty of confidence. Um, I had boyfriends. I had a, a very interesting life. I was never able to get along on my looks. And I didn't have the fantastic career that I have now, so I had to work very hard. So I think that even added to the, the whole picture, that I didn't have it easy, and I did have to work, and I did have to learn. And now you advise people. That's, you, you work as a, as, a, as, a, as a sort of advisor on cosmetic surgery. This is a terribly general question, but is there a most common request you get from people, a most common reason people come to you? And is it mainly men or women? It's increasingly men, but the majority is still women. People just want to look better. You know, they say 90% of people have something they would change about their body. And I think the other 10% just haven't really thought about it or they haven't, they haven't got enough years under their belt to realize maybe they want to look younger, they want to look better. And, and I've had this many, many times. I've met people who say to me, my friends, who say, oh, I'd never have surgery. I would never consider it. I like myself the way I am. And I always say, well, there will come a day that you look in the mirror and you're no longer happy. It might be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And the number of people that then get in touch and say, you know what that, you told me about that day, it's here. I want a facelift, or I want Botox, or I want fillers, I want something done. And like with tattoo, tattoo artists today, you know, you see people who would probably never consider it before. They do it because they see it around and they think, I like that. I would like that too. So I think the media and, and, and our culture does have something, some input on that and some influence on it. Thank you. I know. Just to say a little bit, if it's possible, I 
je, je voudrais dire que vous avez bien fait de faire ce que vous aviez envie de faire et d'utiliser une technique, une technologie nouvelle comme la, la chirurgie et la chirurgie esthétique. Euh, mais ce que je voudrais dire au public... Euh, c'est que pour moi la beauté c'est pas du tout ce, euh, le, le nombre d'or je pense que euh, chaque, euh, chaque tribu par exemple africaine avec euh, les femmes ndébelées avec les, euh, les coups girafes ou bien euh, les femmes avec des labrets euh, ou bien euh, les corps de Kranach euh, du peintre et les corps euh, de Rembrandt c'est pas du tout les mêmes donc ma conclusion est que ce sont les idéologies dominantes qui, ici et maintenant, à un point géographique et historique, euh, fait des pressions pour qu'on soit comme cela. Ok, we'll just have the translation of that and then uh, we'll... Um, so... I would like to say that uh, I'm very glad that you did um, what you wanted to do at the time with the technology that was available to you, but uh, beauty doesn't necessarily have uh, something to do with the golden mean necessarily. It has to do with the prevailing ideology of the time. So it can be uh, various things uh, from the Ndebele um, tribes in, or the giraffe necks, or it can be the... The, the bodies of uh, Rembrandt and Kranach, the painters, it's, it's a very different things that, de uh, that depend on the historical and sociological and cultural context. And I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to this as a discussion point later, if that's okay, Cindy. Thank, thank you. I'm, do please be ready with your questions, because I'm going to be asking you all to join in this discussion, and I'm sure we'll pick that point up again. Um, but we'll move on. <laughs> Orlan, you have introduced yourself prematurely <laughs> because spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> because Orlan is indeed our next speaker. So, in reverse order, I'll do the introduction. Um, yes, I am the last. But, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'm very sorry. No, no. Orlan is, um, is is a French artist and a French speaker, indeed, uh, whose work investigates the position of the body in society and the political, cultural, and religious forces that play out on the body. And we've heard a little bit about that. She uses for photography, video, sculpture, biotechnology, and performance. And from 1990 to 1993, created a series of surgical operations slash performances uh, to represent a new image of her face, which she uses in her work. And she is the first artist to have worked with surgery in this way. So courtesy of Justine, we're going to hear a little bit from Orlan. So um, we, what we want to know is why do you use surgery to make art? En fait, je, je suis une artiste euh, multimédia euh, qui ne s'intéresse pas aux matériaux ni aux technologies, euh, qu'elles soient nouvelles ou anciennes. Euh, ce qui m'intéresse, c'est effectivement d'avoir une idée et ensuite de trouver la bonne matérialité. So, I'm a multimedia artist. I'm not interested in materials or technology, whether they be uh, new or old. What I'm interested in is finding a concept, an idea, and finding the correct medium to go with it. Et donc j'ai fait tantôt de la sculpture, tantôt de la photo, tantôt de la vidéo, tantôt j'ai cultivé mes cellules avec les biotechnologies et tantôt j'ai fait aussi de la chirurgie. Mais je, je, ce n'est pas mon job, je suis juste passé par là. So uh, sometimes I use photography, video, or 3D, or I've cultivated my own cells um, to make art and I've also done uh, some, some cosmetic surgery. But... Um, It's, it's uh, the medium that just occurs to me because of the concept. D'une manière générale, en fait, tout mon, mon travail euh, interroge le statut du corps dans notre société euh, via toutes les pressions sociales, politiques, religieuses qui s'inscrivent dans les chairs, dans les corps. Um, in a, as a general rule, uh, what my work is about is the different pressures, so the historical, sociological, uh, cultural pressures uh, that are embedded on the body um, because of society. Et j'ai utilisé la, la chirurgie esthétique, en fait, pour la remettre en question et pour, justement, dérégler ces codes et ces stéréotypes habituels et pour montrer, donc, qu'il n'est pas obligé, qu'on n'est pas obligé de coller aux images qu'on nous montre comme celle qu'il faut imiter. 
um, I've used cosmetic surgery to question these codes and um, to show that we're, we don't have to stick to the images that people tell us that society dictates um, as images that we have to imitate. So it's going against the stereotypes. L'idée principale pour moi, c'était de mettre en fait de la figure sur mon visage, c'est-à-dire de la représentation, parce que l'idée était de travailler donc dans l'art et je n'en c'était pas le, le, le désir personnel. Je voulais faire une nouvelle image avec mon corps pour fabriquer de nouvelles images dans mes œuvres. Um, the main idea was to put representation on my face, so to use um, the image of myself to create uh, a new image for my art. Et d'ailleurs, j'ai fait ensuite beaucoup d'œuvres avec cette nouvelle image et en interrogeant justement des images euh, venues euh, des précolombiens ou venues des amérindiens ou venues euh, de l'opéra chinois, etc. Um, and I've created many images for my art uh, using um, several types of uh, other representations, uh, whether the pre-colonial pre-Columbian or uh, Amer American, Indian, African or um, Beijing opera images. En fait, c'est à la lecture d'un texte d'Eugénie Lemoyne Luciani, qui est une psychanalyste lacanienne, que l'idée de ces séries d'opérations chirurgicales euh, m'a traversée. Um, it's by reading a text uh, by uh, a psychoanalyst, a Lacanian psychoanalyst, Eugénie Lemoyne Luciani, that it occurred to me to have these cosmetic surgeries. Uh, je vous lis le texte. La peau est décevante. Dans la vie, on n'a que sa peau. Mais il y a mal donne dans les rapports humains parce que l'on n'est jamais ce que l'on a. J'ai une peau d'ange, mais je suis un chacal. Une peau de crocodile, mais je suis un toutou. Peut-être traduisé Skin is deceiving. Is deceiving. Um, in, in life, there, we on, only have our skin, but there's a misunderstanding in human relationships because we are never what we have. I have angel skin, but I am devil. I have crocodile hide, but I am a puppy. Une peau de noir, mais je suis un blanc. Une peau de femme, mais je suis un homme, et vice versa. Je n'ai jamais la peau de ce que je suis, il n'y a pas d'exception à la règle parce que je ne suis jamais ce que j'ai. The skin of a black person, but I am a white person. The skin of a woman, but I am a man, and vice versa. I never have the skin of what I am. There is no exception to the rule because I am never what I have. Et en, en fait, euh, ce, ce texte euh, m'a montré que la, la religion et la psychanalyse s'accordent sur le fait qu'il ne faut pas attaquer le corps. Et pour moi, c'est quelque chose de complètement anachronique, puisque nous avons à la fois toutes les greffes d'organes, et quelque chose qui est très important pour moi et qui met en perspective mon travail, euh, c'est les greffes de visage. Um, it, made her, it made me realize that what uh, psychoanalysis and religion have in common is um, that you can't touch the body, um, which seemed to me a complete anachronism because we do have uh, organ donors and organ implants. And what I'm really interested in is face implants. Et en fait, euh, j'ai essayé de changer complètement l'esthétique du bloc opératoire pour à la fois diriger la photo et la vidéo dans le bloc opératoire. Donc j'ai mis mes œuvres, euh, des œuvres en tout cas, j'ai mis euh, du stylisme, c'est-à-dire toute mon équipe et l'équipe chirurgicale étaient euh, costumées euh, par, par exemple Paco Rabanne, je crois que vous avez vu l'image, euh, ou bien Issey Miyake ou euh, d'autres stylistes. Et l'idée était effectivement de, de changer complètement le, le bloc opératoire, de le dérégler, d'en faire autre chose autrement et de faire des performances successives dans le bloc opératoire, en particulier en lisant des textes. So the, um What, what was important was to change the aesthetic each time of the operating room. Every time I directed the photo and the videos and installed some of my works around the operating room and had fashion designers 
uh, dress um, everyone, all the participants, uh, whether Paco Rabanne or Issey Miyake. Um, and it was a completely new aesthetic each time because it was a performance in the operating room. It was the operation as a performance. Et pour chaque opération chirurgicale, en fait, il y avait complètement un style euh, extrêmement euh, différent. Donc ça pouvait passer du style camp, euh, je ne sais pas si vous voyez ce que c'est, par exemple, ce qu'a fait John Waters, euh, ou bien le baroque, ou bien quelque chose de complètement high-tech. Every time there is a completely new aesthetic, a different aesthetic, it could go from camp to baroque uh, or um, even high-tech. Pour moi, c'était vraiment important de faire bouger aussi, à l'intérieur même de l'art et des expositions que j'allais avoir par la suite avec ces œuvres, de faire bouger les pressions qu'il y a sur le corps des œuvres d'art. Parce qu'il y a autant de pressions sur le corps des œuvres d'art pour entrer dans certains réseaux euh, que sur le corps euh, des femmes et des artistes. What was important to me with this... To me, with this work, was to uh, shift the pressure away because there's to to change the pressure because there is so much pressure on uh, the body, women's body, but men's bodies as well, and to focus on that pressure. Hollande, je m'excuse, mais c'est trop long. Je peux couper? Ah. Oui, la, je veux terminer oui. par une phrase. D'accord, merci. Il euh, y a une phrase de Nietzsche qui m'intéresse beaucoup qui dit que nous avons l'art pour ne pas mourir de la vérité. So she just like to finish with one sentence from Nietzsche, uh, which is, we have art so as not to die from the truth. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And uh, I'm, je m'excuse for the cooping, but um, we're going to... <laughs> but we will come back and please do be ready with some questions. I know there'll be lots coming out of that. I'm going to move on to our fourth speaker, if I may, um, Alessandra Lemmer, our final speaker, a psychotherapist and director of the Psychological Therapies Development Unit at the Tavistock Clinic. Now, your interests are focused on body image disturbances, so body dysmorphia and body modification practices. Uh, trauma and adolescent development and you are indeed the author of Under the Skin which is a psychoanalytic study of body, body modification. So please welcome Professor Alessandra Lemma. And uh, very well placed, I think, to come in last on this. At one extreme, Alessandra, there are people who would say that radical alteration of the body is always a sign, a, a kind of pathology. What would your position be on that? I think if you wanted a categorical answer to that, it would have to be no. I don't think it can be seen always as a sign of pathology. But of course, as a psychoanalyst, I'm not interested in categorical answers because the human mind is far more complex than that. And the first thing to say is that we all modify our bodies. Everyone here in this room, by putting makeup on, getting dressed, has modified their body. So when we look at people who radically modify their bodies and point to say, well, I'm not like that, I think that in itself can be thought about as quite a defensive retreat away from thinking about what it means to actually inhabit a body, which puts us all under tremendous pressure. And I want to highlight three things that perhaps can be picked up in the discussion. The first thing to say is that the body is our anchor in reality, which means that even if we can delay the signs of aging, as you were describing to us, The body goes inexorably in one direction only, and that's underground. And you heard it first in Selfridges, okay? So <laughs> the second thing to say is that living in a body means having to acknowledge that it has been given to us. It's not of our own making. I don't mean this in any religious sense, but that actually two people have to come together to create a body. And actually what that means is that forevermore, whatever you do to your bodies, you always have to acknowledge that the body bears the trace of otherness of the other. And this is a fact of life that can be very difficult because we all struggle to varying degrees with accepting our dependency on others, the fact that we are indebted to others in different ways. And the final aspect of what it means to be embodied, which I think is problematic and may explain why we all modify our bodies, is that by virtue of our embodied nature, we are always subject to the gaze of the other. We are always being looked at by the other. Now, being looked at can raise all sorts of anxieties. It can raise anxieties that have to do, let's say, more with our desirability, 
am I all right? Am I going to be loved? If I change various aspects of myself, will I be loved more? But also, being looked at means that we can feel very intruded upon. So sometimes the modification of the body is a way of managing the felt-to-be intrusiveness of the other by taking ownership of the body and remodeling it according to an image that makes us feel that the body is my own, that I put my own very personal stamp on it, which may be one of the reasons why people tattoo their bodies, and we might come back to this point. Uh, nous donne le très bon exemple de la transformation. Euh, donc je ne vois pas comment, pourquoi on ne ferait pas comme la nature, parce que entre la tête d'un bébé et la tête d'un adolescent, la tête de quelqu'un qui a 30 ans et quelqu'un qui a 50, 60, 70, 80, c'est extrêmement, c'est de l'extrême macovert, c'est affreux et c'est obligatoire. Alors que quelqu'un qui essaye justement de faire bouger les barreaux de la cage, qui essaye de sortir du cadre, c'est, il imite la nature. Um, in, a, in a sense, it, um, when we see nature, there's um, an, an extreme makeover as well because uh, we go from the face in a, of an infant to that of a child, an adolescent, and someone who's 50, 60, 70, 80. Um, that's a really extreme makeover. So who, whoever is trying to change their body in this radical manner is, in a sense, uh, imitating nature as well. I mean, in terms of the issues of whether it's always pathological or not, as I said, I don't believe that it is. I think that what is more interesting is to approach this question from the point of view of what's its meaning. What are we trying to do? Uh, because we all have a story to tell, and we may not choose to tell the story, but the story that none of us can avoid telling is the story that our bodies inevitably narrate. So through the way we present ourselves to the world, we are telling a very individual story. And that's obviously what I'm interested in as a psychoanalyst. And I think it's a more helpful platform for considering these body modifications than to actually categorize things as forms of psychopathology necessarily. Having said that, if a behavior, whatever it is, and for tonight's purposes we're talking about body modification, but if a behavior becomes compelling and necessary to maintain a sense of who we are, to be able to face the outside world, then that deserves very careful attention. Because it's one thing to have a tattoo or two because it makes us feel a bit better. It's another thing to feel that unless I have a tattoo every month, I actually can't leave my house uh, or a cosmetic surgery procedure or whatever it is. So, Alessandra, you, you raised something very interesting there because you talk about alterations as perhaps, unless I misunderstood you, a way of escaping from our parents and our genetic inheritance, that we're trying to make ourselves individual rather than the product of uh, our genetics. But on the other hand, I'm conscious that we are also sometimes trying to conform. So to have the Cape Middleton nose, for instance, to be au courant with the, you know, what the look is of the moment. Do you, is that, is that, do you sense that dichotomy? I think there is always a tension between what it means to become an individual and to fashion ourselves out in an individual manner and the way in which that very fashioning actually makes us much more conformist. Uh, and you see that in adolescence, of course. So adolescence, developmentally speaking, is a time when the modification of the body, you could say, is a very appropriate way of trying to claim a sense of oneself as separate from the parents. But in making yourself different from your parents, you are conforming to another view which makes you actually not so independent. And of course, nowadays, because parents are doing the very things that young people were trying to do, we've got to push the boundary ever more to make ourselves very distinct. Yes. Mo, did you want to come in? Yes, just uh, briefly on, the, on my own subject on tattooing. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that, when, well, these days more than in the past, uh, people being heavily, by heavily tattooed, I mean heavily tattooed, like arms, legs, uh, almost a full body suit or a full body suit. Um, there are more and more people. Um, there was a picture before um, of a guy with a full back. That was his first tattoo. But it really depends, ultimately, it's always very subjective to the person. Because if the person consciously wants a bodysuit, but carries on his life unaffected by the fact that he's having a tattoo, I think it's quite of a, of a normal fact these days. Maybe people with far less tattoo can be more compelled, more troubled in wanting more. So I don't think it's the amount of body modification, but more what that body modification means to ultimately to the wearer or to the subject at end. 
um, it's not so much the visual outcome that they're after, but it's the process of transformation which becomes very compelling, in fact. Can I just add, um, <coughs> I, I'm fascinated by what you say, and I, I agree that we are trying to control our own destiny through looks, but at the same time, had I been born with a different face and body, sort of, say, Heidi Klum or, or someone like that, a supermodel, I wouldn't have changed a thing. I was only trying to make myself into an image that, or a masquerade even, that is more acceptable and more highly rewarded in this society we live in. It was to gain an advantage and to gain power. It wasn't because I had any sort of psychological issues. Again, had I been born with different genes and I didn't have this, this combination <coughs> inside that was my genetic lottery uh, ticket, I would have pursued something totally different, maybe studied people who do it like you do. So that's my take on it. Cindy, you used a word there, masquerade, and when Alessandra was writing, was talking, I wrote down the word mask, because this, this idea of uh, protecting yourself from the world, from people's gaze, by creating a different look, did that resonate no, with you? No, no, not at all. I'm not protecting myself. I am creating, because, because we look at people and we judge them instantly, we form conclusions about how whether we want to know them or not, whether we want to have sex with them or not, whether we want to, to meet them or whether we want to cross the street to avoid them. And you can control that thought, the way people perceive you, by changing the way you look or adjusting the way you look to gain the desired response. That was, that's the masquerade, not hiding behind a mask. It's a, it's a slight it's different. different dynamic. Yeah. I want to open it up to the floor, and I'm sure, I hope Hans are uh, going to shoot up. But before I do that, um, who, who here has a tattoo? Not so many. It goes against your... <laughs> it goes there. against... You're obviously not suburban middle-class women. <laughs> you have a tattoo. Um, and is anybody here happy to admit that, that they've had surgical interventions on their, on their bodies? <laughs> So we do have somebody there. Does anybody have a question immediately for our panel? Um, I just wondered, um, like, to what extent do you get feedback or cross-check your interpretations of beauty before you get a procedure done? <laughs> um, and, yeah, whether you do it and how, how, in what fashion do you, do you do that? I just look in the mirror and I decide whether or not I should have something done. Um, also, I look at my photographs and I tend to watch myself back on television, not obsessively, but just to check to see if anything needs doing, because you do look differently on camera. But I do have some clients who ask everyone, I have one guy who does surveys on the internet and goes to real self and says, can you, can you tell me what you think about me? I would never, do, I don't, the, the, the interesting um, conflict here is that I don't care what people think about what I've done or, or the way I look. I know that what I've done to create this face is correct artistically. And everybody's always going to have an opinion. You know, you can, you can change everything about yourself and make yourself perceived to be perfect, and somebody will still find something to pick on. So I don't listen to public opinion. I listen to what I know and what I know what looks best on my face, what works surgically and what, what works safely. I work within a very, very strict criteria and framework of safety and predictable results. That's why I can have surgery and know that it's going to be okay and my client's the same because I know how it turns out because there are a lot of factors that the normal person off the street who decides to have surgery, to be honest, they really don't have the chance of having very good surgery because you have to be an insider to know what really yeah. works, what doesn't and who's good. You were saying that you get, you do the surgery because, you know, it gives like certain reactions from people um, and that, you know, in a way, it makes it certain things easier because of the way that you look. So I just wondered, you know, at some point there's going to be some sort of feedback, like some sort of, you know, is it is it actually beautiful? Am I doing the? I mean, there are many, 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 many different ways of interpreting beauty. I think. So. Yes, but there are only there. If you look at the biological imperative, there are certain characteristics and elements you need to have in order to be considered attractive in this. Well, not, it's not even a modern thing. I mean, if you look at the elements of attraction for women, um, smooth skin, meaning it's not wrinkled, meaning you don't have a disease that you, could, you might not be a suitable breeding partner with, your children might not be healthy. Um, long legs, mean, where women wear the high heels to try and get this. 
adolescent sort of gait, where the long legs are long because the body hasn't quite caught up, that's the ideal breeding age. I mean, these things are there for a reason why when someone looks at you, they go, oh, this person is hot. Well, you can extrapolate what they mean by hot, and it always comes down to the same things, and it's as old as, as, as mankind itself. <laughs> Do we have more questions? Yes, there's somebody over there, a lady in a white. Extrêmement maigre. Je considère que, en fait, nous avons l'éternité pour être squelettique. You also have to be extremely thin, and I consider that we have whole eternity in front of us to be skeletal. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. We have a question from the lady in the white shirt. One of the really unfortunate things that happen in the Western world is. I think is teenage bullying that comes from a really young age about girls specifically being really unhappy about they, the way they look and do you, would you advocate to young girls, especially girls developing into teenage, teenage well, world age 13, would you advocate young girls to go for surgery and to accept that they don't look a certain way and should go and put themselves under the knife and do something about that? Well only, you know, I was that young girl so I I have friends who also were not so glamorous, but they went on and had very, and still have very fulfilling lives and are very, very happy. It's only if it really bothers you. Some people don't, don't actually care how they look. So I have been bullied. I know what that's like, but I didn't have the surgery to stop the bullying. I got on a plane and came to London and formed a rock band. You know, I didn't care about the bullying. It, it didn't affect me. What affected me was my art training when I realized that I didn't have the face that, that was possible with cosmetic surgery. So I don't consider myself a role model for young girls, maybe for grandmothers, but young girls, I do feel uh, bad that they have this pressure. It was always there. It's, it was there in high school, you know, many, many decades ago when I was that age. So I don't know what the answer is. It's just uh, try and stop people bullying, because people will always bully you about your looks or about you don't have the right clothes, you live in the wrong part of town. You know, if bullies will always find something to bully about. It doesn't have to be your looks. I'm going to come to Alessandra on that because uh, I, I think it's an interesting okay. question as to is there an age at which we should be saying, no, you know, wait, get through adolescence, find yourself. You know, should, should you have to be 33 before you start? Should you have to be 18? I mean, you must get a lot of girls coming to you with this kind of body image problem. What's your perspective? I think it would be very difficult to set an actual age, but yeah. I think you're right that there is such a lot in flux during adolescence at the best of times, let alone if there are psychological problems, that I think to do anything radical during the adolescent phase is something that some people may you know, regret. I mean, I think it's terrific that you feel so positive about your experience, but I think that some of the people I see, to give the other side of the story, would be that they are individuals who don't have certainly the psychological capital, let alone the financial capital, to actually undergo cosmetic surgery. So what tends to happen in a minority of cases, admittedly, is that people perform DIY surgery. They do terrible, terrible things to themselves in order to try to acquire a body that is felt to be appealing um, and to make themselves desirable and I think that's the other side of the story and in fact if you look at a lot of the extreme makeovers there is a real bias in inviting people onto these shows who actually come from rather impoverished socioeconomic backgrounds uh, so there's a whole kind of is social issue there that could you know, it's beyond the scope of tonight but I, do, I, I really wanted to mention that to not forget that aspect of it. Mm, mm. I mean you bring up the question of, of regrets I mean, it, you can't go back from some of these things. You certainly can't go back from tattoos, not really. Certainly not the ones we saw. <laughs> well, there are some methods where... But, no, you can't really go all the way back. These days, there is a way you can remove them, but people usually remove... They, they lighten them in order to go over again with a fresh... <laughs> and you go, go back to the, to the 80s tattoo and the 90s tattoo. To go back with a fresh tattoo, so yeah. completely removing is, a, is way more intrusive than, a, than applying ink on the mm. skin. Have you ever refused to give someone a tattoo? Have you said you're too troubled, you're too drunk, you're too... Oh, well. well. <laughs> as long as you got the money, sit down. No, I don't... No, 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 of course. If someone is... In certain circumstances, we don't, we don't perform a tattoo, but... What would those circumstances be? Well, as you said, if someone is really drunk or we can see that is not really making the right decision. But then again, it depends. 
the decision could be maybe someone is too young to have his neck and hands tattoo before uh, you know first you need to sample what a tattoo is especially the implication that he has with uh, in society if you have a forearm tattoo for example before you move to your hands and necks and so we right. might we might you know suggest to think about it a little bit but one where it can't be seen, where well, you can hide well, it. you know, you need to live with them, yeah. and then if you accept them first, then you can move on to stages. So, you know, th there are some criteria, but those requests are, are very few. Yes, yeah. so I agree. Everybody's an individual. You know, people are different. You take each case as, as, as the person is an individual person. You don't just make a generalization about age or whether they should have it or not, but look into their motivations as, as a person. We've got another question over here. Hi, this is a question principally for uh, Alessandra. So you work at the Tavis Stock Centre and you work with people who have uh, problems with their body image or they're harming or they're not happy with the way they've been born. Now, Cindy name-checked um, if she had been born looking like some supermodel, then she would have been really happy, she would have been accepted into society but Cindy, supermodels are 0.001% of the population. You know, so that's never going to happen. So what I was going to say is, Alessandra, she and a woman nearly 60 is still referring to that age of supermodels and Naomi Campbell and Cindy Crawford. Where do these, where do these images and ideolo ideology come from? Is it the media, um, magazines? You know, where do these people get these ideas from that that's what they want and make them uncomfortable in their own skin to be needing to do stuff to themselves? Let me say two things in response to, I think, what is a really good question. The first is that if I look at my practice, uh, not at a Tavistock, but where I work privately, I see a number of women who are actually professional models who feel very, very ugly. And I would give anything to look like them, you know, and they don't perceive themselves in that way. So actually, it doesn't really make everything all right, uh, for a start. Now, the relationship between uh, pe why people pursue body modifications, including cosmetic surgery, and the impact of the media, I think is, is hard to gauge, really, because what is clear is that we're all subjected to the media onslaught that puts incredible pressure on us to look in a particular way to conform to Angelina Jolie or whatever it is. And there is research showing that girls, particularly girls, as young as six, you know, will put their hair up and say, I've had a hair, I'm having a bad hair day. Now, that's rather worrying at the age of six that one is already so self-conscious. But what is also clear is that the majority of us don't go on to develop body image disturbances and don't go on to pursue cosmetic surgery in a compulsive, addictive manner. So clearly, the media in and of itself uh, cannot be the main causal agent. And it is increasingly available, of course. I mean, it is, it is now sort of pretty much high street that you can drop in and have something done. Would your feeling be that it's too available, that it's too easy? Well, I do think that the, the ready availability of it is an issue. If you have someone who is in crisis, um, mm -hmm. then the fact that you can get it off the shelf makes it more likely that you'll, that you'll get it and then realise this is not the solution to my problem. Uh, I mean, we did a small research quite recently looking at people who were pursuing cosmetic surgery uh, and other cosmetic procedures relative to a control group of people who had never been for any cosmetic procedures. And there's no doubt that in the cosmetic surgery group and cosmetic procedures group, there was an elevation of relational difficulties, depression, um, and very low self-esteem. So we need to think about that. So if those individuals have ready availability, they may be more likely to, to opt for it than if it's harder to access. Thank you. C'est pourquoi, en fait, moi, j'ai fait poser deux implants qui sont habituellement mis sur les pommettes de chaque côté du front. C'était pour mettre de la différence. Et euh, l'idée, avec la chirurgienne qui m'a opéré, qui est une chirurgienne américaine, euh, je lui ai demandé non pas de ressembler à quelqu'un ou à quelque chose, je lui ai demandé quel est le geste opératoire qui n'a jamais été fait, qu'elle n'avait jamais fait et qui n'était pas censé apporter de la beauté. Et effectivement, si on me décrit et qu'on dit c'est une femme qui a deux bosses sur les tempes, on peut penser que je suis un monstre indésirable. Si on me voit, ça peut changer un peu.
Um, so she had, uh, well, I had an operation whereby um, I put cheekbone implants, uh, implants that were regularly used to enhance the cheekbones on the brow, on either side of um, the forehead, um, which creates uh, little horns or, or bumps, if you will. Um, and she asked uh, the American surgeon, female surgeon, which, um, which operating which operation have you never done, um, has never been done before, and with, with, a goal, with not a goal to create beauty, but um, to create difference and otherness. And if people describe me and say that I have bumps on my forehead, maybe I will seem undesirable or I will seem like a monster, but if people see me, then they might think differently. I wanted to ask Alessandra what she thought was the pathology or non-pathology of what strikes me as the most extreme kind of body modification, which puts the various things we've been talking about in the shade. But because it's practiced by hundreds of thousands of very ordinary people, doesn't get seen as pathological, and that is body building. Um, well, by perfectly ordinary seeming young men turn themselves into freaks. Or, well, I mean, certainly, if you wanted to get laid, you wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> as, as far as I can see, women don't like it. So, but it's a very, very widespread thing across the world. Great, th and thank they, you. The results are truly brief. And thank you for bringing in the male perspective. That's very helpful. Alessandra? Well, I think as with any body modification, I think it can be seen as an a form of pathology. I don't think it invariably is. But I think what you're raising, which is terribly important, is that there are so many practices that are so embedded in everyday culture and normalised that we don't pick them up. And particularly for men, this was the case with eating disorders. Because men dealt with their anorexia through exercise rather than restrictive eating, it didn't get picked up as readily in the early days because going to the gym was seen as a sign of doing something healthy. Whereas, in fact, the psychological function of excessive exercising was exactly the same as the woman who was restricting her food intake. So I think that's a very important point. Mm. Thank you. We've got time for a couple more questions. And as ever, all the hands are going to shoot up now. So I'm going to ask you to keep, it, uh, keep your questions as brief as possible. The lady in the, in the pink? Top, beige, pale. I wanted to ask Orlan to what extent you identify with notions of the post human or cyborg in your own artistic work, seeing as kind of biotechnical intervention in the body has gone so far that perhaps we're not human any longer. Qu'on homme comme cela. Mais je, je pense que c'est une évolution qui est, qui est dans l'air. On a tous des prothèses. Euh, par exemple, moi, j'ai cru faire un acte extraordinaire. Vous voyez, tel que je suis, je suis bridé avec un bœuf. Euh, enfin, tu, tu peux dire ça We call them cyborgs, but I think that's the way of the future. We, more, of, more of us have implants. And the way you see me now, I'm a, a hybrid with a, a cow. Oui, parce que mon... mon mais peut-être il y a plusieurs personnes ici qui sont hybridées avec un bœuf, mais elles ne le savent pas. Uh, maybe it's the case for several people over here, but they just don't know it. Parce que moi, c'est un ami dentiste et collectionneur qui m'a dit, écoute, tu n'as pas assez d'os, il faut que je te fasse une greffe. Donc, je vais te faire une greffe, soit de tes propres os, soit de tes implants. Choisis, qu'est-ce que tu veux Alors, j'ai dit, bien sûr, mais invitons l'autre. On ne va pas rester entre soi. Um, it's a friend of mine, a dentist and a, a collector, who told me, you don't have um, enough bones in your body, so either I need to take um, some of your bones uh, for your teeth, or you need to get implants. And so I said, well, of course, let's invite the other in, let's not stay all by yourself. Mais euh, je pensais que c'était exceptionnel, et j'ai appris que c'était une technique qui était très employée depuis 6 ou 7 ans. Mais la plupart du temps, on ne dit pas aux patients que, effectivement, c'est des os de bœuf. I thought it was quite rare, but apparently it's more and more common uh, ever since the past six or seven years. But most of the time, um, the patients are not told that they're getting some bone from a cow. 
C'est pour répondre à votre question, parce qu'on est déjà dans le post-humain, on est déjà dans le cyborg, mais la plupart du temps, on n'a pas les informations suffisantes pour se rendre compte de l'endroit où en est le corps, où en est le statut du corps euh, dans notre société. Donc euh, c'est cela le, le pire, en fait, parce qu'on est en train de vivre des choses absolument hallucinantes, en fait, qui font partie de la science-fiction de d'il y a quelques centaines d'années, qui on ne pourrait même pas imaginer. L'Internet, euh, beaucoup de choses, on ne pouvait pas, même pas imaginer. So we, we are already in the post-human, in the, the cyborg era. It's just that we don't have the information readily available to us to understand that and to adjust the status of our body um, because we're in the realm of what would have been a few hundred years ago, complete science fiction. I'm, I want to move on. Can we take two more questions? We've got uh, one lady here. Yeah? My question was, you said that um, you engaged in surgery because uh, you thought it would help you gain power. Uh, to what extent did you see a gain in power after sort of somewhat radical transformation? And to what extent was that power maybe uh, diminished some when they found out that your looks were because of surgery? Oh, well, that's a very interesting question. First of all, um, I started noticing, uh, after maybe three or four operations, where I had changed. I, might, I had improved my looks by about 30 40%. You notice it in everyday feedback in everything you do. For example, if you want to cross the road, people's cars will stop. You go to a bar, you get a drink spot. I mean, these are very superficial things. Um, people start asking you where, you where you bought your outfit, what foundation you use. And that extended to the point where people started asking me for cosmetic surgery advice. So that, which I never planned to have a career in it. That, I never even planned to go public, but I ended up selling my story so I could have more money for surgery. Because back then it was... It was hard to find the money. I mean, now it's... I mean, I had my nose done in Eastern Europe I, at a fraction of what you'd pay in, in uh, London. You, can, you don't even need to be rich anymore. So, um, yes, I definitely noticed every single day the smallest things. It's as if someone switched a, a spotlight on me. And that could be uncomfortable. It wasn't what I was used to, and it's, it's not easy to switch it off. Of course, I'm much older now. I'm not as hot as I was 20 years ago. But still, I, I want to be a good, better looking old lady because we do treat people differently according to the way we, we see them, according to the way they, the, the way they look. And it's just human nature. It's not, it's not anything that even the media put pressure on, on me because I did it before we had the internet, before newspapers were full of celebrities. It was the 50s and 60s when I grew up. I had no such pressure. But once you get a taste of it, it can be rather moorish because you realize that this is how the other 5% live. Um, the power, it, nowadays it comes from being able to have all the information and knowledge and help other people who, who want it done too. Mais on, on peut utiliser euh, la, la chirurgie dans des voies tout à fait différentes, yeah. Cindy, parce que par exemple, euh, moi, j'ai probablement obtenu les mêmes résultats avec mes deux bosses sur les tempes. Ça drague beaucoup. Hein. C'est comme ma décapotable. Vous <laughs> pouvez um, avoir uh, les mêmes résultats avec des résultats différents. Donc, avec ses deux bosses, elle a eu des résultats très similaires de gens qui flirtent avec elle. Et c'est un peu comme avoir son carte de conversion très jeune voiture de convertible. Je crois que chaque mot de ça. Uh, we've got one more question here. Um, just, uh, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, just to ask Alessandra, um, uh, I have a three-year-old daughter and I'm having this huge dilemma about single sex or co-ed schools and I wonder what you thought about adolescents and mixed schools, especially in Britain, you know, in, in Europe. I don't know what the issues are in Italy or Spain, but here I'm interested in whether you think body image uh, changes with different schooling? Very good question. Well, I'm going to give you a very personal answer because I, I don't know particular research about this, but my sense is that our bodies are so full of anxiety, um, you know, as we try to discover ourselves, particularly sexually. And I think the single-sex schools breed greater anxiety because there's no real exposure to the otherness of the other. So, in a sense, I think... Um, Co-ed, to my mind, give greater opportunity. But don't come and find me in 20 years' time if it's screwed up your daughter's life. 
Um, do we have any more questions? Because I think I haven't seen any more. Yes, we've got one more hand gone up here in the middle. Um, this is a question. I don't, whoever wants to jump in, but uh, it's basically about. Um, we've all been talking about how um, how many uh, places there are now to have surgery. How the media's really promoted um, body um, beauty. Do you think this is a, a passing fad, or do you think it's with us now, forevermore? Because we've never had this level of obsession over uh, self-image in the past, as far as I'm aware. I think that's, that's a very good question. I'm going to ask each of the panel to give me their take on that. And this is going to be your final, your final sound bite. So why don't we start with Sydney, because you looked ready to speak on that. I think it's definitely here to stay. And the reason it's, it's getting more and more popular, and that this is, this is like a, becoming a tidal wave, is because it's available. There was always the demand. It just was pent up. And now that it's cheaper, it's easier, and people are open about it, Everybody wants it. Everyone wants to look better, and everyone has always wanted to, to attract people. It's human nature. So I say it's here to stay, and it's, it's, it's gaining momentum every minute. Likely to be a backlash, Alessandra? Are we all going to go au naturel? I doubt it, but I think what's clear if one looks at this historically is that we have always modified our bodies across history and across cultures. The form that the modification takes is going to be shaped by predominant cultural sort of availability of different methods, but I think it will always be there. What's very interesting is going to be understanding the fate of the body in virtual reality and the role of avatars and how we can modify our bodies virtually through uh -huh. the, the technology that's going to become increasingly available. And that is going to have dramatic impact, I think, during adolescence. Il y a des choses qui bougent. Par exemple, euh, j'ai vu des reportages de, de boîtes de nuit euh, au Japon où les, les jeunes qui sont déjà très costumés, euh, qui, qui viennent pour s'amuser, en fait, se font faire des, des piqûres de sérum physiologique pour avoir vraiment, mais des bosses, non pas comme les miennes, mais absolument énormes, le visage complètement euh, déformé, ça s'appelle « bagel head ». Et dans ces déformations, on peut appuyer pour avoir des formes euh, différentes. Et donc, pendant ça dure 14 heures ou 24 heures, et donc on peut, pendant 14 heures ou 24 heures, être affreusement laid, horrible Et c'est très agréable and there's going to be even more changes because now you see, for example, in Japan and nightclubs, uh, young people, they take uh, physiological serums um, and they inject it into their face and they become what is known as bagel heads. Um, they have big bumps everywhere and you can actually model them in various shapes, but they're quite grotesque. And uh, it lasts about 14 to 24 hours and you can be extremely ugly, extremely ugly. <laughs> and it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and finally. I think that um, I agree with the, with the panel. I don't think that uh, the, the, the need of, of changing or modifying your body is, 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 is much higher than the previous year. The fact is technology uh, dropped us in a world of sensationalism. So everything is available now, whatever your friend friends getting a tattoo or a nose surgery, probably you'll see it in five minutes on Instagram. So everything becomes more sensational and more available and more and faster and, and gives you the feeling that you need it as well. So I believe that's the only change. But for the rest, I think human being always wanted to modify his body in a way or another. So. Mais les réactions continuent à être toujours les mêmes. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a beaucoup de pression sur les femmes pour, par exemple, qu'elles se fassent faire des liftings pour rester euh, jeunes et belles. Et en fait, c'est toujours la même réaction. Euh, Ou si elle ne le fait pas, on dit oh, « t'as vu comme elle est moche, comme elle est vieille, cette vieille peau, etc. » Mais si elle le fait, on dit « t'as vu celle-ci, elle s'est fait tirer, quelle horreur !» But the reactions stay the same. There's a lot of pressure on women to get uh, cosmetic surgery done. And then when the women get older, either they haven't done it, in which case people go, oh, she's so ugly, or they have done it. And then they say, oh, have you seen so many liftings? <laughs> 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 
I think we've come to the end. We've opened up a, some brilliant scenes there about uh, trends spreading through technology and indeed about how you might alter your avatar and, and leave yourself alone, which is, I think, the, the subject of a whole other debate we can look forward to. Um, I want to thank uh, all our speakers tonight, who I think have been fantastic, and indeed our translator, who not only did the words, but did the, you know, the effects and the, and the delivery, too, towards the end. So well done on that. Um, thank you to Intelligence Squared for arranging this, uh, to Selfridges for hosting the debate, to you all for coming along, and um, thank you all very much for being here tonight.